Hello and welcome to Calvary Christian Fellowship's Wednesday Bible Study. We're so glad that you're joining us this evening. My name is Andrew Pano and we are once again continuing our study on the book of Revelation taught by Pastor Phil Pano. And uh, if you have any questions about Revelation or biblical prophecy, we want to encourage you to reach out to us and let us know. And we'll do our very best to answer one of your questions in our upcoming studies. Also, if you have any prayer requests or praise reports that you'd like to make us aware of, we encourage you to use the contact information on the screen and reach out to us to let us know so we can include you in our daily prayer time, as well as rejoice in the great things the Lord's doing in our midst. We are also thankful for the opportunity to pray for you. And it means so much to see those of you who are watching us on our Facebook page for the comments of encouragement that you're putting in there. And we hope that you'll continue to do so and as well as uh, we encourage you to like and to share this video to your Facebook friends so that way they can see it as well. And if you've not done so, we want to encourage you to like, follow, and subscribe to at CCF Fort Wayne on the various social media platforms. We do try to put the good news of Jesus Christ out there and we hope that it'll be a blessing to you. And if you'd like to be a blessing to Calvary Christian Fellowship through your ties or your offerings of support, you may mail those to Calvary Christian Fellowship, P.O. Box 25544, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46825. We are so thankful for your support of our ministry. And finally, we invite you to come and worship with us in person. Right now, this is Holy Week, and we're looking forward to seeing you for our 6 p.m. Good Friday service. And every Sunday at 10 a.m., we have our uh, Sunday morning service, and those all take place at 233 West Main Street in the heart of downtown Fort Wayne. So we invite you to come and be with us as we worship and praise our great God. And speaking again of worship and praise, we are thrilled to have the music ministry of Nancy Honeytree, and we encourage you to go to honeytree.org to check out the latest updates on what she is up to, as well as we want to encourage you to subscribe to her YouTube channel to catch up on some of Honeytree's music videos. And some people wonder uh, how I got the name Honeytree. I think you ought to share it. And I kind of assume that everybody knows, but... Um, it, may, it may be that there's somebody watching us that wonders uh, what honey tree is all about. Well, when my maiden name, Hennigbaum, is German and it means honey tree. You know, like Tannenbaum means, oh, Christmas tree. Christmas tree, Christmas tree. yeah, or evergreen tree or whatever. <laughs> but uh, Honigbaum means honey tree. And so when I was just a kid, that uh, I was told that. And then when I was a hippie, we were into like, translating our names you know like Lowenstein was Lionstone and you know what a <laughs> neat name and then the, but if my tr if if I'd had Nussbaum I think I would have left it alone because that would be nut tree <laughs> <laughs> but honey tree was cool and my friends uh my hippie friends called me that but it was really a, a nice um like a healing thing for me because I'd gone through a lot of feelings of rejection as a teenager. And then mm. when I, I had a bunch of friends who kind of thought I was, you know, they liked me and wanted me to hang around and gave me a special name. And, and so, you know, it was a real blessing. And, and I've heard Honey Tree share that it came from Henning Baum. Uh -huh. But that's the first I'm connecting with the fact that that was even before you were a Christian or started yes. singing. I always thought it was a name you adopted to become a Christian. No, it was artist. my nickname as a as a high school hippie. Wow. And then um, when I became a Christian and started writing songs, just, you know, when I was a senior in high school, I got saved, praise God. <laughs> and kind of the Lord I, I picture him kind of picking me up by the scruff of my neck and carrying me <laughs> away from the danger of, you know, the life, the lifestyle of my, of my old hippie friends. And, uh, and, but when I started writing and we wanted to record, we thought, let's just keep using the name Honey Tree because Hennigbaum would have been a, very difficult as a stage name to try oh. to deal with. But Honey Tree was easy. And plus, we didn't even use Nancy Honey Tree. We just said Honey Tree. It was like, it was very hippie ish. It was like, you know, Moonbeam oh. or something. Well, <laughs> in, in telling 
stories from the past, because that's from 50 years ago going along with that. You've heard us tell about my dad's Uncle Joe, my grandfather's brother. And they were the only two of all of those brothers that came from Sicily, eight of them, I believe, that all came. And they were the only two that were ever saved out of their Roman Catholic background. Mm -hmm. And they had a born again experience. And I'm not gonna get into that right now, but my poor Uncle Joe could not. Oh, he couldn't remember Honey Tree. No, he, he, he called her every, yes. it was Honey Dew and uh -huh. Sugar Bush. And, I, yeah. he, and he was sincere. He just could not yeah. get Honey Tree worked out at all. That was fun. He would well, back, go back to the home church and say what a blessing Honey Dew was. Uh -huh. he, he was up in Fort Wayne. Right. Well, I've heard a lot of derivatives. So. <laughs> I'm sure you have. Uh, but you do know you're going to be the nut tree as far as we're concerned yes, from here on now, out. I shouldn't have told you that. But um, anyway, so there is a song called Honey Tree. And uh, then I wrote a sequel to that, which is called Evergreen. And that was the, um, the beginning song on an album called Evergreen. But I'd like to sing Evergreen today. Please. What? Okay. When the seed was planted I prayed that I would be just like a fruitful tree and grow evergreen. Lord, help me grow evergreen. I'm tender. I bow deep and my branches grow high reach to the sun for all to see he makes the tree complete he makes the high Now, we have seen angels announcing the previous judgments that have happened. Remember? We had the, the, the angels that were able to open up the seal because Jesus was the Lamb of God that said these seals can now be broken. And we, we know that angels announced with trumpets those judgments. Now, there are some that want to say that Jesus is an angel. But we know from Hebrews, maybe Ben can put it up quickly, Hebrews 1 and verse 4 tells us that Jesus is better than the angels. Yes. And that's a word of comparison of his nature. By nature, he's better than the angels because he's that third member of the Godhead, mm -hmm. okay? We're not a uh, second member of the Godhead. We're not going to go back into that right now. But here's what I want to take a look at. We do know that angels is the Greek word angelos. Mm -hmm. And angelos means messengers. We know that Gabriel was an archangel and he announced, okay, the coming of Jesus when he was born on earth. So they're, they're, they're messengers, okay? Uh, we know that Daniel was praying and the angel that watches over the nation of Israel was, was trying to come when Daniel prayed and he said in the heavenlies, there was, there was warfare that took place, mm -hmm. and he was coming as a messenger to Daniel, all right? So angel, angelos, are messengers. Do you remember Jacob had a, a dream? Uh-huh. 
and we even have a song, you know, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. Who, who does it say are climbing? Angels. Well, what is this? I just said the song. Who, oh. well, who does the song say is climbing Jacob's ladder? We are. We are. And yet, how have we always pictured, whenever you see renderings artistically of Jacob's ladder, who are on it? Angels. Angels, right? Because that's what it says. He saw angels ascending and, or excuse me, yes, ascending and descending on the ladder. Mm -hmm. And we know from that story that that ladder really was an Old Testament revelation of Jesus. Because over in John's gospel, Jesus came across a guy named Nathaniel that was sitting just underneath a tree. And Jesus said to him, hey, Nathaniel, I know you were sitting under a tree. And that, that pretty much amazed him. You knew about me. And you said, I'm an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. And Jesus said, that impresses you? You're going to see the Son of Man with angels ascending and descending on him. He was, he was talking about himself. Mm -hmm. And the angels that he's referring to are not angelic beings, but human beings. Oh. Because we, in a very real sense, are messengers. Amen. As believers. Honey Tree, you've been a messenger. Yes. All over the world and, and still through the internet Praise and your the YouTube Lord. and boy, we're hoping that that hundred that that, that hundred and no, a hundred and twenty or thirty or how many you're needing are gonna sign up to get mm -hmm. that thousand number reach so that Honey Tree can even be more effective in what she's she's doing as a messenger of the gospel. And that's why it doesn't say, you know, angels are heavenly beings, right? So we would see them descending in ascending. But Jesus wants us to be the messengers on the ladder of Jesus that are ascending. Remember, isn't that our prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. And how many times have we said with the worship and praise when Honey Tree is leading us, that we experience a touch from heaven hmm. that's brought to earth. She's a, a messenger that's ascended on that ladder of Jesus to bring that spirit and the praise glory God. of God. That's a beautiful mental picture of it. To us. Now, the reason I'm saying all of that is these angels, and I'm just given something to think about, okay? File it away. Don't write any hate mail. Send that to Andrew. He gave you the address <laughs> earlier. But will you look with me of a couple of descriptions of these last angels that bring the judgment. One's found over in Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19, Ben. Doesn't matter what translation you use. Verses 9 and 10. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. This is one of these messengers, okay? Yeah. But he said to me, do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, a, a, a fellow servant of yours, and who? And your, brethren. and your brethren who hold fast the testimony of Jesus and worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Well, wait a minute. This messenger said, wait a minute. Now, we know we're not to worship angels either. Yes. But this messenger says, I am of your brethren. That's a little different description than of the other angels. Let's, let's look and say, well, maybe you're pulling that one out. Here's another one of the same descriptions. Look in Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Now, there's the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heard the words of this book, worship God. 
Now, we know that um, there are saints in heaven who have arrived and now after the judgment seat of Christ, which we know that's where we're going to give an account as believers, that'll not be determining heaven or hell. We'll talk more about this a little later when we get to another judgment called the great white throne judgment. And that will be when heaven and hell is going to be handed out. But those of us who've arrived as saints, now there's going to be a time after that that remember Jesus said, we're going to reign with him. We're going to be kings and priests now unto God. That's going to be for all of eternity. I personally believe these seven messengers, because look what it said back in chapter 15 is a description of them. In Revelation 15, when they're being described, it says in verse 6, the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple. They're clothed oh, in linen. I see where you're going. They're clean and bright. Mm -hmm. And they're girded around the chest with golden sashes. Remember, we had the revelation of Jesus. He has a golden sash mm -hmm. that's girded around him. And we're going to be serving, reigning with Christ in eternity. Mm -hmm. That's why it doesn't appear what we're going to be like when we see him. We're going to get to be like him, not only with a glorified body, but we're going to have golden sashes. Hmm. I, I personally believe these are now a transition of not spirit beings, but they are going to be seven messengers that God has been able to entrust. It says they're of the prophets. Remember that where we yes. are over in the other portion mm -hmm. that apparently are going to have a special assignment from heaven mm -hmm. to come back to earth and be bringing these bowls of judgment to be poured out. Now, I'm not saying that's dogmatically, mm -hmm. but I tried to give some scripture to back up mm -hmm. where I'm coming from. And like my dad said, I'm not just sucking that out of my thumb. <laughs> there are a couple verses. Now, if you're going to get upset about it, it's okay if you think they're real angels too. All we know is they are angels and they're coming to bring these judgments. Mm -hmm. Now, look at what else we said is in this 15th chapter. Because it says, not only are these angels there, but now there are some at a sea of glass. Now, we have seen this sea of glass earlier in the book of Revelation. Ben, would you put ver chapter 4 of Revelation and verses 1 through 6? And remember, this is after the rapture of the church that we looked at, where the door was opened in heaven, and the voice said, come up here, and now they've gone up and they're standing before you. Here we get the description, and look carefully at what it says. Verses 1 through 6, Ben. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven, and the first voice, which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after these things. Remember, that was a long time ago, almost a year ago. <laughs> we, we saw that that was the breakdown of the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. He saw the things which are, are, the things which will be, and the three divisions mm -hmm. of the book of Revelation. So it's now... He said, immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one was sitting on the throne. Verse 3, he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius. I hope that brings back some memories for those who've been studying with us. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Verse 4, and around the throne were these 24, were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns, remember we already talked about that, For now it's been the great exchange, on their heads, verse 5, out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now we know they aren't seven different spirits, those are the seven descriptions of the Holy Spirit, verse 6. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, mm -hmm. like crystal, and in the center and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. But other than that, this sea of glass is unoccupied. Mm -hmm. Okay? In chapter 4, okay. right? Okay, right. Yes. 
But now, in the book of Revelation 15, we're seeing this sea of glass one more time. And there is a, a complete occupancy of the sea of glass. And the ones that are now on this sea of glass are the tribulation saints. Oh, the ones, that, the great multitude that comes up? Out of the, out of the tribulation. Wow. And these are the ones that are being privileged now to be standing on that sea of glass. Praise the Lord, right in front of the throne of God. Amen. Now, that's a beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. Because we won't take time to look at it right now. But remember, it says that Moses uh, built the tabernacle. Uh -huh. And that's in the book of Exodus 25. But in Hebrews chapter 8, it tells us that what Moses built, he was given the design of it on the mountaintop. Yes. And it was after the pattern mm -hmm. of what's in heaven. And we know that same thing is true, that the Holy Spirit through David gave the revelation to his son Solomon of the temple that was to be built. And it is a replica, a replica of what was in heaven, yeah. what is in heaven, uh -huh. was what was he built here on earth. We're going to come back to that temple business a little bit. But in both the tabernacle and in Solomon's temple, there was um, seven articles of furniture. And they were to be displayed in a very specific way because they represented uh, the progression to God. Okay. Okay. Because you came in through one door, whether the tabernacle, that tent, mm -hmm. or the, the, the temple that Solomon built, you would enter one door. Okay. And when you came in, the first piece of furniture that you entered was a, an altar of sacrifice. Now, that lets us know that the only way you can make your approach to God is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Then right behind that was the second piece of furniture, and that was what was called the, the brazen laver. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was a great wash basin. Now, that was what was there in the tabernacle. But when Solomon built his temple, and you can read about it, we won't take time right now, but in 1 Kings chapter 7 and in verse 25, you'll find that description of it. There were 12 oxen, uh -huh. okay, and they were made out of brass, and they were all where their rear ends mm -hmm. were facing in. So they all were facing, it's easier to say they were facing out than to do that. All right? so they're all facing out, all the way around, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. And this mammoth laver was placed on top. Okay? And here's what's beautiful, is the description of it. By the way, we're getting a lot of detail here. But the description says something that really kind of stood out to me when I was studying it. Because the 12 oxen, are given, and if you read it, they're given in a counterclockwise description. Okay. Okay? Now, God doesn't do anything by accident, and he stuck that. He could have just simply said, the 12 oxen were there, and this was set on top, and that was all. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit felt it was necessary for us to understand that they began in a counterclockwise order to be put there. Well, what happens at this laver? Well, in the tabernacle, they were made out of brass, and that brass that they had was polished because it said the women brought their mirrors. Well, they didn't have glass mirrors. Mm -hmm. They had brass that polished, and that's how they would see their reflection, okay? And that's what they made this out of because they'd already been, in their progression to God, they'd already been to the, lav to the altar of sacrifice. That blood has already been shed once. But now they were getting dirty, okay? Because they were walking around that tabernacle on an earthen floor and their feet were getting dirty or they get they're handling things in that dusty area of the wilderness and they would need to be washed. And what they would have to do is go to that water of the laver and wash themselves. And that becomes a type of the word of God. We come to the altar of sacrifice with Jesus. We only need to do that once. And we're coming up again on, on, on our Easter season and Good Friday. And, and what did Jesus do at that Last Supper other than the Passover? He washed the disciples' feet. He washed the disciples' feet. Remember that? 
and, and in washing their feet. Remember, he got to Peter, the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth. And, and, and when he got to him, Peter said, you're not washing my feet. Nuh-uh. And, and Jesus said, if, if I don't wash your feet, then, now watch. He didn't say, you have no part in me. He said, you have no part with me. That's a big difference, that little preposition. Because, you know, some people go, well, was Jesus saying that if, you know, if we get sin in our life, then we're not in him anymore? No. He said, if you've got areas in your life that are unclean, we have no part with him in what he's trying to get done. Mm -hmm. So what does he do? Peter said, not going to wash mine. Jesus said, you're not going to be with me if I don't wash. And he said, well, then wash all of me. See, that? He go, there he goes again. No, you don't have to get all washed all over again. You just, when you're a Christian and you fail, all you got to do is just clean up what got dirty. Okay? That, and Jesus said, just let me wash the part that needs to be clean. And, get the, and that's what the laver was. The laver said, you don't have to go back to that altar of sacrifice. You just you go here and do it. But you know what the enemy does? Honey tree, have you ever had this in your ministry over all these years? Do you ever get up to get ready? I shouldn't put you on the spot. You know what, you know what I've experienced? Okay. I, I, I can get up to minister. Mm. And remember something awful? That I've done. Mm. And, and it usually will happen on a Saturday night. Yeah. Or while you're having praise and worship and I'm being blessed and all of a sudden I realize I'm next and there'll come something that'll go, how dare you get up and speak to these people? Mm. Well, how could you tell them about this? Stuff? If they knew what's going on, you know, that's what the enemy wants to do that. Yes. With our past that Jesus has washed clean. Yeah. That's why it says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to keep on cleansing us of all of our unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. Don't get saved all over again. Just let him clean up the part that's dirty. And you know what he does? He does it at that counterclockwise place where he says, I want you to know, the enemy wants to bring up things from your past. And when he brings them up, just let him know, they've been washed in the laver. They've been washed in the laver. Yeah, well, this happened a long time ago, and that clock's going back in our past to try to remind us of those things. And you know what God's wanting to say every time? The enemy's wanting to remind us of that stuff. Is God's there going, I forget. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten all about that. I put it in a sea of forgetfulness. Praise the Lord. Whew. That's wonderful. He's washed us. So we see a sea of glass and these tribulation saints, okay? And we don't know, maybe if my theory is right, maybe one of the seven of these angels that maybe are humans who've got these linen garments mm -hmm. that have been standing on that sea, they got to stand there saying, remember when we got the description earlier, they didn't defile themselves? Think what they had to come against to be able to say, no, we're going to stand mm. for what Jesus has done in our lives. Now, they're up there, and there are two different songs that are being sung. Uh -huh. There's the song of the Moses, and we know that's found over in the book of Exodus chapter 15, if you want to read his song. I mm -hmm. think that's what they're saying. It's the only song we have recorded. Mm -hmm. But we do know this. What was Moses responsible for doing? Bringing the law. Pardon? Bringing the law. Yeah, that too. The Exodus. Huh? The Exodus. Let's go with that one. How about it? Okay. <laughs> but I it's like that y'all are doing that. They did, they did the law was given by Moses. Mm -hmm. Yes. It'll be on Saturday. Huh? Oh, oh the, the Ten, Ten Commandments. Commandments. <laughs> nice plug, Andrew. <laughs> well, Moses, we also know, was the one, as we just said, was the one who brought them out. Mm-hmm of Egypt, brought right. them out of slavery. And they're going to be the songs in heaven of the bondages that Jesus has brought us out of. I'm thinking, Honey Tree, whenever you sing and you're talking, you, you, after all these years, you still go back, mm. not to the hippie days, but as a hippie with self-image battle mm. and the bondage of rejection. And I'm sure Andrew can identify with this because I'm sorry for what I put my children through, but you that are children of divorce and that pain and the bondage that's mm -hmm. there. And, and then we made our own rebellious, sinful choices too. That we end up you in. Know, it's not other people's fault that we. 
uh, end up in all mess. these yeah messes, just all we kinds just of made bondages. We a mess of ourselves. <laughs> and and so there's going to be a song on Moses, where Lord, thank you for bringing us out and yes. delivering us mm -hmm. out. But there's also the song of the Lamb that's going to be sung. And uh, I know we talked about the donkey of Jesus riding in on mm -hmm. Palm Sunday on the donkey of that humility that Jesus displayed in our message this past Sunday. But can I give you maybe a little different insight about the donkey, maybe why Jesus was riding a donkey, not only to fulfill prophecy? Mm -hmm. Am I running out of time? Go ahead. Well, look with me in Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. I think there's something going on here that... Um, not that I know of. Help me, because I feel like there's a rebellion going on here in the camp between my I son and Ben. You're taking their side, aren't I you? I haven't been watching the time. Uh, Exodus chapter 13 and verse 13. Ben, can you put that up for us? Exodus 13 and verse 13. Of every first offspring <laughs> of a donkey, you shall redeem with a lamb. Oh. But if you don't redeem it, then you shall break its neck. Hmm. And every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Now, in Exodus, they just in chapter 12 have known what it is to have the song of Moses. Mm -hmm. They've just been brought out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting another story about a lamb. And we're also having now, of all of the animals, we get a donkey that's being used. Mm -hmm. And what does it say? Now watch. A lamb, I hope you'll Write it down, Andrew, because this is good. This is what my cousin Tommy used to say. This will preach, okay? <laughs> a lamb has to be sacrificed. But the donkey, it has to be redeemed. Okay. And if you don't have it redeemed, you don't sacrifice it. You break its neck. Mm. So, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. Mm. Okay? What's being said to us in this verse? Well, under the law, which we know, honey tree, how was the law given? Through Moses. <laughs> okay. Through Moses, we got the description of what were called the clean and the unclean. Uh-huh. And the, the Jewish people, by law, they could not partake of the unclean. Right. Okay. One of the unclean animals was a donkey. Oh, my goodness. I hadn't thought about that. Um. Well, that's why I'm here. I don't write <laughs> songs and you don't think about donkeys. <laughs> but I mean about Jesus riding on a donkey. Maybe I'm just throwing it out there. Maybe he was riding on the donkey as the lamb to give us a picture of what I mean, was going to take place. And yes. that is, there's the shadow in the Old Testament of the substance to come in the New Testament because that which is unclean, it can't be sacrificed. Right. There's nothing that we unclean sinners yes. can do <laughs> exactly. to pay for a sacrifice for our sin. Mm -hmm. But... We can be redeemed. <laughs> Praise but the Lord. only way that we can be, <laughs> the only way we can be redeemed is by the sacrifice of the clean. Mm -hmm. And that's the lamb. And so the Lord and the law, for the very first picture of redemption, takes the picture and says, now, listen, if you aren't redeemed, you can't get your own sacrifice mm -hmm. of yourself you'll break your neck and be lost. And you know, if you have not accepted the clean Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, then you'll never know what it is to have eternal life. If you're trying to do it through your own works, you say, well, I've been a good person.
person. I've been a good provider. I'm a good worker. I'm a good parent. Whatever, I'm a good citizen. Whatever. It, none of that can ever, ever cause the uncleanness of the wages of our sin to be paid. But Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, spotless, sinless, became the sacrifice that we as the unclean become, could become clean, that He, because He as the clean, became unclean. That's the song of the Lamb. Yes. There's not just the song of Moses that He delivers us. But He's redeemed us. Thank you, Lord. He's paid for us. He's bought us. He, I love the word redemption because it means removed from further sale. There's the story. Uh, well, mm -hmm. I have to close with this. And that's the book of Hosea, where Hosea was, was married to a woman named Gomer. She'd served in the Marines. No, that's not, that's not true. And it's a tough story to understand because God told Go Hosea to marry Gomer. Mm -hmm. And yet she was a prostitute. And apparently things went pretty well. They had a child together, but something went awry and she backslid. <laughs> she got involved because there's every indication the next two children that were born were not born unto Hosea. They're children that were born out of an illegitimate relationship. And she ended up taking off with one of her lovers and going out to be with her lovers. And they all used her and used her up. Matter of fact, it even says that Hosea, if you read it very carefully, he got concerned about her and went to her lovers because she didn't want anything to do with him anymore. And he was worried about her, and so he went to the lovers and said, here, take this, and gave money to help feed and clothe and take care of her. And they took it and just simply sold her off as a slave. And there she was, and she got, she got purchased for the price of a lame ox on an auction block. But if you read it carefully, it says Hosea was the one that bought her back. And that becomes a picture, first of all, of what God did with the nation of Israel is they were led out by Moses, okay? Moses brought them out of, of Egypt. And what does it tell us? It says that, that Joshua then led them into the promised land. Mm -hmm. Remember that? And they got there and they backslid and they, they, they fell away from their relationship with God. And, and God still took care of them, mm -hmm. and yet they ascribed it to the gods they were worshiping, just like that relationship of Hosea and Gomer. And yet, it says Hosea went and bought her back to be his wife. And that's what all of a sudden we find Jesus doing for us, is he came when we were on the auction block, mm -hmm. being sold as slaves unto sin. And Jesus said, what was the price for Phil? And whatever Satan was doing with his bid, to try to get me to destroy me, to break my neck as a stubborn donkey. I know what you all are thinking. The Lord said, no, I'm going to redeem him. Mm -hmm. He's mine. Amen. I've bought him. I've removed him from further sale. And isn't it interesting that it was Joshua, and his name means Jesus saves, mm -hmm. that led him into the promised land where they screwed up, but you know who one of the two people were that brought the children of Israel back from their captivity to the land where they belong? There were two people called Zerubbabel and Joshua. <laughs> Once again, Joshua comes to say, I'm leading you back and bringing you back to where you left your first love. The song of Moses and the song of the Lamb are both being sung on this sea of glass by tribulation saints that have come out that are singing unto the king as a kingdom of kings. Well, we thought we were going to get all the way done. I think we got the angels yes. and the sea of glass yes. in two songs. That's right. 
You just have the heavenly temple. We'll look at the heavenly temple next time, and we're together, all right? All right. Sounds well, good. Well, thank you, Pastor Phil. Thank you, Honey Tree. And thank you, Ben. And all, thank all of you who have been watching us tonight for our Bible study. We do hope that you'll continue to be faithful in uh, your watching of these videos. And also, as we alluded to some of our past studies, please go to our YouTube channel by searching for at CCF Fort Wayne to catch up on some past Bible studies that we've been having here on Revelation. Finally, if you'd like to be a blessing to our ministry with your tithes or an offering of support, you may mail them to Calvary Christian Fellowship, P.O. Box 25544, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46825. God bless you. Have a wonderful Holy Week.